boom, I'm recording. All right. Uh, we can just start. I, I usually have no problem singing, okay. so we don't have to worry about it. Um, all right. Well, Laurent, um, and let me, even though I guess I don't have to say your last name necessarily, but I'm sure I can pronounce it. I'm, I'm pretty good with names. Um, hold on here. Let's see. So uh, I'm going to... Boozero, I'm going to say. It's Laurent... It's Laurent Buzero. That's the American way of saying no, it. If no, you want to say no, it in French, no, it's, it's Laurent, okay, Laurent. Buzero. It is Laurent, 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 Laurent Buzero. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. It does sound like it makes you sound angry, so I'd rather you do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> the American no, way. <laughs> je, je suis très jolie. Oh, no, that's pretty. I'm sorry, that's pretty. Ah, no, bon, uh, happy. Uh, je, triste, that's sad. That, How do you say happy again? Uh, uh, heureux. How do you say happy? Heureux. Oh, okay. I'm going to leave the rest <laughs> of... my. I know enough French to get me in trouble. That's what I usually say. So. Uh, okay, um, good for you. <laughs> where are you now? In L.A. I live in Los okay. Angeles. Oh, very good. Okay, so uh, good morning then. Good and, morning. Uh, so tell me, how does a Frenchman end up wanting to make a film about Natalie Wood? Although I, I, can, I, I can also guess the French have always loved cinema and American cinema, so it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it's interesting. Um, I've, I've, I've always um, noticed that, uh, um, particularly because I grew up in France, that the French uh, um, really had a huge appreciation for American cinema. As, as, as you know, you know, Truffaut and the new wave were responsible for um, calling Hitchcock, who arguably is British, but uh, made, mo made most of his big movies, you know, in, in, in America, you know, yeah, was sure. an auteur, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, um, and, and so Wells, I suppose, yeah. uh, Orson Welles and so on, you know, and it's kind of interesting that um, at the same time, you know, the French uh, never learned anything from American cinema. <laughs> <laughs> and they and they made films that I didn't relate to, um, and and therefore uh, as soon as I could I moved to America. But um, you, you you know it is true that um, even today um, there are about five actors that are um, consistently coined in France as iconic, and that would include James Dean. And oh, good, Nathalie you're going to mention them. I was going to ask you next. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would include James, James Dean, Dean, Natalie course. Wood. Marlon Brando. Um, um, I would say Steve McQueen. Okay. Um, and, you know, Brando, uh, I would say potentially, but also Clint Eastwood, you know. Those are sort of oh, like the, the actors. If you go to a movie poster shop, in France, which I visit constantly when I'm over in Paris, uh, um, those are the uh, the most um, expensive items and 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 most difficult items to find are from those actors. Um, well, what about Marilyn Jerry Monroe, Lewis? What about Marilyn Jerry Monroe? Lewis? And oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, Marilyn Monroe as well. Yeah, Marilyn Monroe um, uh, quite um, is also quite collectible. I would say Audrey Hepburn also, as far mm -hmm. as as. But you know, like I, 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 not so much. I don't remember so much. You know, Betty Davis or John Crawford. You know, like mm -hmm. some of, uh, you, you know, it really is interesting. Um, uh, but I know that in preparation for this uh, for this film, you know, I, I'm very tactile. I. I, I I love collecting things, and, and, and I, I found uh, this uh, really rare, rare French poster of um, Splendor in the Grass and, mm. uh, and bought it uh, for a little fortune, actually, and, and, mm. and it was restored on linen and everything is just beautiful, and, and also um, a poster of Rebel uh, Without a Cause, a French one, um, which had uh, Natalie on it, um, 
uh, because as you know, I, I believe the American poster does not have Natalie uh, 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 represented on the poster. Uh, it has her name, but not her. Uh, you'd have to triple check that. But um, in any case, you know, so, so my interest in, in her career, um, in her films, you know, have, have followed me my entire life because I, I've right. always, um, I, I mean, I discovered her work, you know, at the French Cinematheque or, or because I grew up in Paris, you know, there's so many movie theaters and, and, and they would constantly play um, over and over, you know, um, the classics. So I would go and see her sure. films. I, I remember when Hitchcock died, they literally re-released all of his movies, including his silent films and, and so on. And mm-hmm. I saw within a month, I, I think I had seen all of the movies he had directed. You know, so Paris was actually a really great city yeah. to be in wait. if you were a film buff, you know. Oh, I know. Um, yeah. Are you saying, but wait, I remember Hitchcock, when I moved... Hitchcock died? Uh-oh. <laughs> Shocking news. Oh, you're a funny <laughs> Damn guy. It. Okay, yes. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I was going to say, I wanted to say, uh, don't lose your train of thought there for whatever you were well, about to say. Because my know, jokes I was about are if I interrupt that, you. Uh, yeah. No, no, that's okay. I, I, I was about to say that w- when I, I moved to New York in the early 80s is when Brainstorm, which was Natalie Wood's last movie, as, mm. as we all know, um, was released. And, and, and I, I got to see it at the Ziegfeld Theater, which was a really big, big movie theater that is no longer. Wow. But, um, I know. I, know. Uh, I, I, I remember being so touched by that movie. Um, uh, because it's dedicated to her, and I, I was a huge fan of of Chris Walken and of Louise Fletcher right. and Cliff Robertson, and and of course of Doc Trumbull, who is really a, a true visionary. You know, um, not only as a visual effects, uh, mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't, I would say, it, it, not only as a technician, as he, you know. Uh, push forward the language of film, but he's a real visual artist, you know, someone who, who um, tells stories with uh, uh, visual effects. And, 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 you know, of course, he's famous for his work with um, Kubrick on 2001 and Steven uh, Spielberg on Close Encounters and, and really Scott on Blade Runner. But uh, he directed Silent Running and and, yep. and also Brainstorm. Um, but, you know, the thing that was super interesting in mentioning Brainstorm um, is that I, I, I rewatched, obviously, all of her films, all of Natalie's movies in preparation for all my interviews. And as, as I was talking and becoming really close to her family, like Natasha and R.J. Wagner, and, and, and I found out that she actually had a choice of movies. She was producing her own films, and she was one of those mm-hmm. actors that had actually a lot of power, a lot yeah. more than I, I, you know, that I ever knew. And, and in that sense, uh, she was extremely different and, and polar opposite of many of our contemporaries who were part of the studio system and never rebelled against it, um, unlike her. Yeah. Well, that and, was definitely and, a, yeah, that was definitely a surprising thing to learn from your film about how just how powerful she was and exceptional she was in terms of the her able to choose her films because you know at the time ingenues like herself just did not have that kind of control over their career they were subject to the studios she was at that end of that studio system right she was like at the very tail end of it some of those other peers you mentioned in that list you you mentioned of those icons a number of them i noticed were in that transitional phase out of the studio system and into kind of the new the new cinema but anyway go ahead with uh, natalie yeah so so what i was saying is basically you know the fact that she was able to choose the movies that uh she wanted to make really gave her the power of selecting things that mattered to her therefore yeah. i would argue that she is one of the um foremost and only autobiographical actors you know, because she was able to choose the film she did, um, you can look at her film and re- uh, you can look at her films mm. and, and really get a sense of who she was and what she stood for and subject matters right. that mattered to her. So 
when you look at Brainstorm, for instance, you know, it's a story of a couple that's on the brink of, of a divorce. And through the adventure that, so to speak, you know, through the plot, they rekindle and reteam together and go through a transformative experience and fall in love again. And, and you imagine at the end that they stay married. And that's not unlike, you know, her own life. You know, she uh, met R.J. Wagner, fell in love, married him, divorced him, remet him and remarried him, you know. And um, I could see why she loved making brainstorm or what she would choose that movie as as um uh, as a project for two reasons one being because doc trumbull was you you know as i said you know a great visionary and i could uh, you can see that she was constantly wanting to to work with new directors i mean she she did some of the early films of paul mazursky for example you know who became a real leading voice in sure. in um oh, McCarroll. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, in cinema, but uh, Doug was definitely, you know, uh, in the 80s, you know, a new movie by Doug Trumbull was definitely an event. And also the chance to work with Chris Walken, who is fresh off of, uh, you know, movies like um, like The Deer Hunter, and you're like, you know, blown away by, by, yeah. by him as an actor. Annie, Annie, um, Annie Hall. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so it's kind of interesting to see also that she chooses that role and that mm -hmm. that role speaks to her own personal life, you know. So, so up until the end when we sadly lost her, you know, she was making a film that was very, you know, similar to, to something that she had experienced herself with R.J. Wagner. What was your relationship going into the film production with, with the family? Because I, I, it seems, you know, it was finally a real platform, a significant platform for her, her daughter. Well, primarily, I guess, Natasha, you know, yeah. who, is the, who is the daughter of her and, and RJ, uh, to... Well, she's uh, not the daughter of RJ. She's oh, the excuse daughter me, I'm sorry. Of, yeah, you're of, of I'm sorry. Yeah. Don't correct me, please, on my show. Don't. Don't. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for correcting me is more more to the point yeah right they, she did con consider them both you know her yes. dads because of she was so close to both of them and they really both played so central roles in her life and she loved them both dearly which i think comes across very beautifully in the film but it seems as though to get to my point is that it was really the first time the family had a real platform to r r say their their piece Finally. Yeah, so so I'll I'll tell you um, the complexity of of, of that Thank question. You. Number one, you know, it was um, on on a kind of you know funny way. I was always confused with Natasha about Daddy Gregson and Daddy Wagner, and I, and she would say my father and not my stepfather, mm -hmm. and I said Natasha. The audience is going to get confused. They're going to think you have two fathers. <laughs> and said, well, I do. I said, I know. But for the simplicity of storytelling, we have to call RJ your stepfather and, 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 and your real father, you know, your father. And, and so we, we had a, a funny exchange on that. But, you, you know, when I met Natasha, um, I, uh, first of all, on, on a personal level, we immediately connected. She is really uh, um, an amazing person and, and she has gone through so much, you know, in her life and continued to go through so much during the making of this film, you know. She lost her father as we made the movie. Richard right. Gregson passed away and she lost arguably her mom's best friend and confidant, you know, uh, Mark Crowley passed away a few mm -hmm. weeks ago, uh, right before we went into confinement. So it, it has been a really profound and emotional uh, uh, a journey, you know, and, and it kind of underlined the importance of making this film because we lost arguably the you know, two of the most important people in in her life and in Natalie's life, you know, the, the you, you, you know, the man with whom she had her first child, Natasha, and Mark Crowley, who um, she, she not only uh, uh, trusted the most as a friend, you know, but also created boys in the band, uh, thanks to sure. Natalie Wood, because uh, she gave him a platform to, 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 to be able to be a writer, you know, um, but um, 
what I wanted to say is that I was concerned, as were my producing partners at HBO at Amblin, that a film produced, you know, co-produced by a member of a family with right. a, a bit of controversy and, and polarizing discussions on on the loss of Natalie, you know, was not going to be, you know, truthful and honest. And, and I guaranteed them that that would be my my role to make sure that while Natasha was um, involved, that she would be respectful and not be in the cutting room. And 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 I I, I would say that she she really wanted to keep her distance. She she trusted me that that I was going to embrace the story that we were trying to say, but she was not going to get in the way of of the sort of. Uh, you know, integrity that a filmmaker needs to have when one is making a movie. Um, and, and so for me, the ultimate test was to do that interview between her and R.J. Wagner, which we designed as a two shot, as you saw, you know, like where mm-hmm. Natasha is really, I mean, you had a wide shot, but they're the two of them together. And, and, um, I, I, I was like, that's going to be the ultimate test. You know, if if this interview comes off really amazing and, and sincere and and we can go to all those places, then that's great. We have a movie. And if it doesn't, then we may not have a movie. And obviously we did come off uh, this those two days um, uh, feeling that there was an incredible story and and that RJ courageously... You, you you know uh confronted the those questions you know with great um emotions and 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 um openness and, uh, yeah and openness and natasha was able to in a way to to keep her composure through 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 that because you know as as um as as a family member you know it's it's difficult to to go to places that you know are are extremely sad and painful yeah. and about loss and tragedy and 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 especially in view of the 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 polarizing aspect of it you know but but it was great and and frankly you know um I created an atmosphere on the set for those two days that was very relaxed and 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 RJ is the consummate professional first of all he's got a great sense of humor and right. so it was not all doom and gloom you know it was there was a no, lot of very funny uh, He's very, yeah, there was a he's lot. He's really of, played up on his persona over the uh, last bunch of years, you know. It's yeah, no, I mean, sh- he's a fantastic know. human being, and and I had gone to Aspen to meet with him and his wife, Justin John, you know. Uh, so, 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 but you know, in between uh, takes and when we would take a lunch break, he he knew everybody by name, and and it's not like he was stepping out and and be by himself. He was he was very very, um, y- you know. Uh, accessible, accessible, and and didn't feel yeah. threatened by anything. Right. Where yeah. where you could see someone, you know, like suddenly oh, you sure. had to talk about this stuff, and 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 he was choking up and and at times crying, you know, um, in front of you know pretty much strangers, except for Natasha, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. So I really um, felt this was at the same time, you know, a test for me to see if we indeed had a, a, a movie you, and, and right. again, you know, it was it was reassuring to to see that we did. So um I'm um I was extremely grateful and and uh and then we kept on going and, and HBO and and my partners over at Amblin, you know, were able to to watch the footage as well and they were like, Wow, okay, we're blown away, you know. So 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 that was really um yeah. That was really great. Yeah. It's tricky. I, I could see why it's tricky, Laurent, because, uh, um, you know, on one hand, you have other productions that have covered this, whether on the, all the way over on the tabloid end of the spectrum, the past coverage or past projects around the subject of Natalie Wood, where, you know, her end is exploited. And then, uh, how do, and then on the other hand, you obviously, you, you can't not grapple with that story that part of her story it's the elephant in the room so you you're in a position if you're making the project you're going to have to deal with that and i think given 
uh, how it came out, I, I, I have to agree in this case, it really was very sensitively handled. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I, you, you know, I, I, one thing I knew we didn't want to do as a, as a company, you know, and, and what I mean by company is <laughs> almost like a theater company, <laughs> you know, is, mm-hmm. is um, we didn't want to do something that, that was at all investigative reportage or, or sensational, you know, it was something that was going to come from the heart and from uh, genuine emotions, you know. Uh, so it, it, it was dictated by, by something to be done tastefully and, and with great respect. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad it came through um, at the very least for you. Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, it was more importantly, how did it come out for, for the family? How did what, what did Natasha? What did RJ? Uh, you must have had a, a fans, and, uh, excuse me, a friends and family type of screening. I'm guessing. Yes, yes. I, I mean, what happened is that again, you know, like I, I finished the film and um, uh, shared it with uh, again my producing partners over at HBO and and Amblin TV and and and. and 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 once we got to a point which was uh, pretty fast, you know, uh, then I I I, I felt um, you know it was time to share it with uh, Natasha, and and she was blown away, and and that was really a great a great moment, you know, uh, because I of course wanted her as my producing partner, you know, and at the same time, you know, as, as, mm-hmm. as, as a member of the family and someone who had so much at stake with this film, you know, to feel that we had done justice to, um, to the storytelling and to the mission we had with the film, which was to sort of restore an image that, um, that, that she felt, you know, had been overshadowed by tragedy. Right. Um, and, and, and then I said, okay, so what do we do about RJ and and also valued you know the 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 reactions of of Courtney and um, uh, the family children. members because um, there was also another aspect where I, I I wanted to make sure that there were no um, factual errors or anything like this so I we also had a couple of consultants on the film you know, who who helped us with, with all that. So there were a few people who, who watched it and, and across the board, you know, people were calling me and it was, they were all in tears uh, um, and appreciative and just felt that the promise that I had made uh, when I was engaged on that film uh, felt like it was delivered. So um, I was I was really happy and pleased to see that, uh, um, you know, uh, the hard work had, had paid off. Uh, also, in the, you, we mentioned the family members and uh, Robert Wagner, of course. Uh, you also talked to uh, a lot of luminaries. Uh, yeah. Benjamin, Diane Cannon, uh, uh, Elliot Gould, Mia Farrow plays a prominent uh, talking head in the film. Um, Don't Hamilton. call them talking heads. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use it in the. I know that that the term gets a lot of character. I'll tell you. I'll tell you that. How, how do you? Uh, I, I. You know, it's interesting. Uh, to me, to me, you know, it, it's my biggest. Is uh, right. You, you, you know my. Um, and I feel comfortable with you, so I, I feel comfortable sharing that with you. you know, I know you, do. The, you You know, as a filmmaker, you don't call a close-up when you watch a movie a talking head, right? It, you go close on someone uh, for um, an because moment. Uh, for an emotional yes. moment. And, sure. and, you know, every time I've done a documentary, uh, um, it, it, you know, I pour so much... Um, so much energy and blood, research. Blood, sweat, and too. tears. We say, yeah. Well, well, I mean, not only to frame the picture, you know, in yes, a way so. that 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 person is you capturing an environment. So, for example, I will give you the example of of Mia Farrow. For example, you know, I didn't know what to expect from Mia Farrow. I I, I knew they were sort of pen pals, her and and Natalie, um, and. Um, 
I thought, hmm, I had read a few letters that they had exchanged and I didn't know what to expect, really. And, and, uh, and suddenly she emerged almost as a voice for Natalie as, mm. as we spoke. There was something, there's something about Mia Farrow that is just so, um, and I get goosebumps even saying it, that it's just, uh, there's a fragility and a beauty and a, a, a something so... Uh, uh, pure about her as a person that I immediately felt when I walked in that I very specifically chose to have her in front of that garden that was covered in snow because I felt that spoke for my emotional response to her immediately when I saw her. So that's what I mean, you know, by... And and then with Robert Redford, for example, you know, we went to... um, uh, uh, Park City, and the the you know we were in that um, foyer that had a lot of wood, but I wanted some light because I knew that the subject matter was was very happy for the most part because everybody loved Natalie Wood, but I knew that we were always going to be getting to a point where it was extremely sad and, and was a bad loss. And I didn't want really the, the interviews to, to, to have a somber kind of look, but because we were in that room, I had to create fake light. So the light that you see in the background, you know, you have a fire, first of all, that, you know, that I lit up and you, you know, I created fake sun. There was no mm-hmm. sun that day uh-huh. coming through, through, through the back with lighting. So that's what I'm talking about, like really creating an environment, you know, that speak for the thematic that me as a filmmaker, for better or for worse, you know, I'm not saying I'm a, 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 a this... Uh, <laughs> fantastic uh, uh, lighting Hitchcock. cameraman, <laughs> but I work really, really, really hard, see, you so, know, yeah. uh, so uh, the to, term, to frame. I so, so, so the when term people say, talking head is a little reductive, in other words. Well, I mean, it's, it, it, it's um, I, yeah, and I think, you mm-hmm. know, it feels like, uh, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, they're just talking. Well, they're not, you know, they, they, you, you really, and, and this is the wrong term to use, but unless you get a performance, even in a documentary setting, you know, right. you just don't have it. And, and so by saying talking head, you just feel like, you know, there was no work involved in, right. in, you, 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 you know, and no, 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 it's, it's, I think it's a great, <laughs> it's a great opportunity for yes, people right. like yourself to enlighten people who are your listeners, right. you know, yes. to understand the work that goes into a documentary right. filmmaking, you know. Um, you, you know, for example, you know, like I know the Tiger King is like the big thing right now. Well, the fact that they chose to, to film people with their shirt off or whatever, you know, is making a statement. Um, yeah, and, 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 and you can't call those, those people talking heads because they are making a very bold and... And and, and, it, and and you know statement by the way that they've decided to frame them and and to present them you know yeah no no and and I it's this is sort of a filmic podcast you know on some level Laurent so you know my using that term and I know you you're 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 you drew at a larger point which I actually really appreciate having that conversation with you. But I use it as sort of shorthand because, you know, usually we refer to when we're talking to other filmmakers, if you talk to them about a talking head, it's more like uh, nobody really likes that term. So it's probably a good time to let it go. But we use it for like an expert, you know, like somebody who's expert has expertise on the subject. And in this case, these uh, luminaries, I guess I'll return to that, you know, definitely were experts on Natalie Wood because they all had relationships with her and they all cared a great deal about her and, and her memory. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, like, as I, as I said, you know, I was surprised, you know, I, it's interesting, you know, in all the years of doing documentaries, there are two people that I've always wanted to meet and never had a chance to was Redford and Mia Farrow. And, oh, that's and, great. Sure. and, and it was, you, you, see, you know, uh, I the would great say, Gatsby as a young person, is that why it was? <laughs> You know, I would say that in a selfish way, you know, I'm like, you know, I don't really 
uh, care if Mia Farrow has a lot to say. I just want to meet her, you know. There know, is sometimes that temptation. And suddenly, you know, when, when the talent emerges as and gives you something that was unexpected, you know. And that's what I mean, you know, like it's like it, there's a whole preamble to an interview where um, that that is just so amazing. It was so funny with with Mia, for example, she had music in the background and I said, you know, we need to shut off the, the music. And so she's talking to the device, you know, like, what is it called? Alexa? Is that what it is? You oh, know? Yeah. Yes, yes, so I... Alexa turned off the music and it's not doing it. And she said, well, maybe you don't want, you want to try it. It's not working either. I said, well, maybe it's my French accent. And, <laughs> and eventually we turned it off. But it was like kind of a light, fun moment. Mm -hmm. that bonded me with her to some degree. And I'm just like, I can't believe that I'm with Mia Farrow and we're both talking to this device about shutting up the music. And right. she was, again, you know, just so... Oh my God, I just... I, I, I mean, literally, this is the first time in my whole, you know, modest 27-plus uh, years doing documentary filmmaking, you know, that I was in tears with all the interviews and literally I would I would have problems talking um, when it came to certain things and, and I was making complete and I told my DPs who are very close to me I filmed with because we were filming all over you know the world literally mm -hmm. England you know and and New York and and and, and LA and uh, I have three DPs that I work with in all those places, you know, who know me very well. And I said, I do not want to hear one sound. I do not want to be, um, once we frame the shot, I don't want to be tapped on the shoulder or anything. I, I, I just want to make complete obstruction to, to everyone in the room except for the talent, you know. So we would frame the shot way in advance. I had a, a, a double who would sit down and while, you know, we were setting up and then, so it was very religious kind of atmosphere, for lack of a better word, you know. Well, and you... and um, anything that got in the way a couple of times, actually, when we were with RJ, there was uh, a, a, a house under construction that day that was making so much noise. And it literally, I mean, I thought I was going to lose it, you know, and... and RJ is the one who calmed me down. He was like, let's stop. Let's have cookies and let's, let's chat, <laughs> you know. Nice. And, but, wow. you, you know, that's how much it, it, it meant to me, you know. And yeah. I, I, yes. I really created an environment that, that felt almost like the way you, you, you want it to be on a, you know, on a film set, you know. And, and you know, oh, with it Mia, it was, you know, it was interesting because... Um, you know, we were filming her with the snow in the background. And again, I, I just thought it spoke so much for, for this beauty that I feel she, she, she radiates, you know, she does. but at, yeah. at the same time, when we got there and I'll just tell you, this is true, you know, I'm not making it up. When we got there, it was very dark and and um the snow was there and and i felt oh it's going to brighten things up and as she started talking the sun started to come out and i just felt wow you know even nature is contributing to to this to to, to the beauty of this discussion we're having you know so again you know this may sound i don't know maybe too to, uh, I don't know, to some degree pretentious, but those are all things that, that are felt so, so intensely, you know? And, uh, um, and again, you know, like with Richard Benjamin and George Segal and, 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 you know, and all those people I've, I've, I grew up, you know, I, I shared a secret with George because I, I told him, you know, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, but the first movie I ever saw you in was in 1977 when I was an exchange student and went to Athens, Georgia, and it was Roller Coaster, the disaster movie in oh, Sense sure. Around. Yeah. And I said, I've collected the posters of that movie and the lobby cards, and I said, do you mind signing my lobby card of Roller Coaster? And... Uh, 
<laughs> was that movie is fun to watch. I, I, um, it actually on some level holds up. It's a little a camp, in a camp way, but it, it generally is a, of that genre which was so popular at the time. It's actually better than you'd think. It's actually a really great film and yeah. very well made. It has a very uh, groundbreaking soundtrack and sound design by Lalo Schifrin, who not right. only created the score, which uh, I but love the sound the score, design as well. But mm-hmm. he's, he he created a whole sound design for when <laughs> the roller coaster goes up and down, and 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 it was um, the the problem with the film. I think is slightly too long in the middle. Uh, um, it would have benefited from a little bit of editorial in the middle. But um, you know, when I first came to L.A., I made a point of going. Going to Magic Mountain and and go to uh, Revolution. I was just like that was one of the first things I did when I moved to LA in wow. 1989. Was was uh, pay tribute to one of my favorite disaster films, Roller Coaster. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, Natalie Wood, what remains behind is going to premiere on HBO on Tuesday, May 5th at nine o'clock Eastern. I think is that that's correct, right? And and Western. I guess it's nine o'clock. Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind, will be on HBO at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern and Pacific, uh, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Well, thanks for so much for just providing such a, um, you know, a passionate, I don't want to say argument, but uh, case for people tuning in to see the film because, um, you know, if you're even mildly a fan of Natalie Woods or of her, the, you know, her... I mean, she's been in so many wonderful films over the years and worked with so many of the great actors of her day who are still around working, actually. Uh, I, I urge people to go see the film. And um, and it was a pleasure to uh, bring you on the, sh- on the podcast, uh, Laurel. Well, thank you so much for having me. And, 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 and again, you know, like, I, I, um, I really appreciate uh, your thoughts about the film and and uh, um, discussing it with me, um, you know, I, I would I would say that a lot of people, you know, young generations do not know who she is, or they'll know who she is because oh, she's the one who drowned, you know, kind of thing. And I really hope yeah. that through this movie, um, and that's she why I think it was. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I you know, that I mean, was the, the, the goal was be, by choosing to have a point of view uh, of a young person like Natasha, that it would engage young audiences, you know, to say, oh, I can relate to Natasha, I can relate to a family story. And then the bonus is that you get to discover not only this, this really fascinating, at times heartbreaking, but obviously also the great triumph of a family. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, you, you get to discover um, Hollywood and an actress uh, like Natalie Wood, who um, really, through her filmography, because she started so young as a kid, you can really just study her films and get the entire history of, of the golden age of Hollywood, you know, just through her and her films. So I hope people uh, do recognize that. Me too. <laughs> it's terrific. Okay, fantastic. I, well, I loved it. Thank you I so it. much. I, I enjoyed having you on. I hope we can do this again with your next Anytime. project, Laurent. It would be tra- or just chat about movies next time. That would be great. Okay. Thank All you right? so much. Take Thank care. You. Okay, you Bye-bye. Too. Okay, bye. bye.